right, over to you, Charles. Well, wait a minute. Let me say, now that I'm in there, how do I use my mouse? Won't allow me to click on that OK there. There it will. OK. Never had that problem. All right, here we go. Thank you, everyone. My name is Charles Miller. Um, I am an environmental advocate. Uh, I am a landscape um, certified native plant landscaper, but uh, that's mainly from the standpoint of advocacy. That's where I do a lot of my work for this. I'm the chair of the Climate Reality Project for Los Angeles. And uh, just really, as I was mentioning to Brent, for those of you who were here early, this is just really my jam. I love to hike, I love plants, and this is something that I've been involved with for a long time. Um, I saw Carol in the room. I don't know if that's Carol Bornstein, but she's definitely one of my heroes. And I know you guys had her featured here a while back. Uh, if that is, awesome. Uh, that's a, a real honor to be able to, to have her in the room. If it's not and you're another Carol, that's totally cool too, Carol. Thanks for coming. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Carol Bornstein, I wanted to mention, was actually uh, involved in plant selection and has been somebody who has assisted with Westwood Greenway. So as we talk about that tonight, keep that in mind that she's one of the experts who was involved in making this thing a reality that so many of us worked at for a long, long time. So I give conversations about this uh, topic uh, quite often, and I, and I do it all over the uh, the, the county and all, all over the area. I've done it in different parts of the state as well, always kind of adjusting it to, to what we uh, are, are discussing in the individual group's interest. And in doing so, I uh, sometimes I it, it, the, the focus is heavily on the greenway. Sometimes the focus is heavily just on native plants. But I, I do have kind of two sections of this where I talk about the importance of advocacy and how advocacy is what led to the creation of Westwood Greenway. So the first half of this presentation will be kind of like why we're doing this and why native plants really make, it, make sense as an issue we can advocate for. And then the second area, I'll go into some of the grittier details of how we went through the struggle of doing this. But the Westwood Greenway is something that uh, goes back now to uh, a, a, an over 15 year history, uh, back to the mid 2000s, almost 20 years history in terms of the, uh, it took that long to have a project come into fruition that uh, really has just come into maturity in the last couple of years. And so it was a really long journey. And I, I like to, and I kid about this, but when young people ask me, how do they get involved in environmentalism and how they do work and make an impact? And I say, you know, do it locally because then you have access, that's really important. But uh, pick two or three projects and plan on sticking with them for 25 years because that's the kind of need that uh, really is out there for a lot of projects. They need somebody who is going to keep fighting a good fight when they're on the right side of things and keep refusing to accept no for an answer. And that's kind of the, the this, this is going to be the moral of the story here in terms of how Westwood Greenway came into being. But uh, we'll talk a little bit about the importance of native plants in terms of advocacy and environmentalism and uh, how that journey kind of took place for me, but also for the, the larger community that was involved in the Westwood Greenway. And I think advocacy, advocacy in general in terms of many of the organizations I'm involved with that are environmentally oriented. Native plants are a great opportunity for advocacy because they can affect every one of these issues that you see on the screen. Now, I'm not suggesting for even a moment that they can solve every one of these issues, but they can play a fundamental role in having meaningful, significant impact in every one of these issues, which I'm going to cover briefly with a little bit of detail to kind of give you some factoids. I mean, you guys are my people, so you already know the importance of native plants or you wouldn't be here. That being said, maybe there's a few statistics or things that you hadn't heard in this in this uh, conversation. Uh, maybe there are things that you've heard differing things, and we can certainly discuss that, that afterwards. Just as a uh, uh, just as a warning, the way I'm doing this presentation, I can't really monitor the chat while I'm doing it. So if you have questions and Brent allows it, I'm more than happy to ask answer questions at the end. But I will not be monitoring the chat as we go forward. So just kind of hold on to those thoughts and those questions if you would like to me to interact with you on them as we go. So some of these slides come from my work as uh, in climate reality, where we do presentations and we talk about uh, climate and we talk about the importance of how we think about climate. Some of these slides actually are from uh, CMPS and Theodore Payne. Some of them are slides that I've created. All of them are used with permission, but I kind of combine them into a larger presentation here. Now this one, st we start off by thinking about climate. And I talk a lot about climate because of the organization I'm in. 
but uh, it is really important to point out to people that it's not the planet getting one or two degrees warmer that is going to kill everybody. That's not that's not the 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 crux of the issue. The crux of the issue is that when we change climate, we change life, and it is extinction of species and the loss of biodiversity that ultimately can make this planet uninhabitable for human beings as well, not to mention the many, many other forms of life that exist here with us. And we have a responsibility uh, of both stewardship and coexistence with uh, those other forms of life. So it's really important to think about the fact that it's it's the life on the planet that we're talking about when we talk about climate, not this nebulous thing that we're talking about. It might be a little bit hotter on a summer day, nothing like that. In fact, right now we're at risk of losing half of the land-based species in our in our world by the end of this century. We're we're facing extinctions at an alarming and and or really unprecedented rate. Uh, uh, short of, of major events like you know meteors falling, meteorites landing, and asteroids colliding with the planet, short of those kind of things, we really have not had an extinction event that has been so dramatic and so fast as the the human arrival in the industrial age in terms of what's happening on the planet. California is an essential part of this conversation because we are one of the very most important areas of the planet with respect to the development of life and the evolution of life. So there are 30 some areas of the planet that are referred to as biodiversity hotspots. Uh, by different organizations that track these things. Now, some of those are coral reefs. Some of them are, uh, you know, in in rainforests and different areas that you might expect. But there are five of them on the planet that are referred to as Mediterranean climates. So these are really important areas with respect to evolution on the planet because the Mediterranean climate is a very, or California climate, as we can also call it, is a very temperate zone where lots and lots of types of life can coexist. And lots of evolution can happen as a result of that. And in fact, I, I have seen statistics saying that, you know, we're talking Mediterranean biodiversity hotspots on the planet. We're only talking like three, four percent of the planet in terms of the land mass. Uh, but we are talking upwards of 28, 29 percent of the evolution on the planet. Different statistics vary, but they're generally in that range. The point here is that there is an explosion of evolution and life happening in those planets. And as you can see, the California Floristic Province is the only one in North America and one of just a handful on the planet. We live here and coastal California has an extremely important role to play. So we have an important responsibility by the fact that we do live here. In fact, the, the Floristic Province, as you can see, matches pretty closely to the state of California. I mean, Death Valley is not part of it. And there, you know, it's not an exact match of the state. Nobody planned it this way. But certainly all of coastal California and some a little bit of Oregon, a little bit of Mexico and, and some of the island chains. But essentially what we think of as, as coastal California is this floristic province. It's also important to note that of those five uh, biodiversity hotspots that are temperate uh, Mediterranean California climates, we have the only one where we have naturally low occurring nitrogen in our soil. That's really important because it's kind of a recipe for so much of what we've done to be the agricultural uh, uh, agricultural uh, you know, supply for so much of the, the United States and in general, big parts of the world. We determined long ago uh, that we, if we dump a ton of fertilizer and a ton of water uh, on almost any plant from anywhere in the world, we can get it to grow in California. And that's been a big key to that success. But conversely, it's important to understand that a lot of times that doesn't work in reverse. So if you take a, a lot of plants that are coastal California plants or even different parts of the floristic province, don't do well in other parts of the world and can't be established in other parts of the world because they rely on that low nitrogen soil chemistry that is part of California. Now that's a broad statement. It certainly doesn't apply to every plant, but it does apply to a lot of the life that's here, which means that we can't just transplant the life here somewhere else and expect it to be okay. We kind of have one opportunity and one footprint here of California in order to make this make this a go in terms of keeping life healthy here. In fact, this, this map right here gives us a breakdown of the biodiversity explosion. I like to have you first look at the middle of the map and the middle state in the, in the union is Kansas. I was raised on a farm in Southeast Kansas. 
and uh, right down on the Oklahoma border in Montgomery County. And we grew soybeans and also uh, wheat and some other things. Now you see that area is white. There are exactly zero species of plant life uh, in within a 50 mile radius of where I was raised that are unique to that area. Now, of course, that doesn't mean there are native plants in Kansas. Of course there are. But those plants are uh, that are native to Kansas are native to a huge, huge area and a big swath of that area. And so they're not just isolated in a certain area. That's not true for so much of the California Foristic Province. We have many, many plants that are unique to just small little zones, little, little niches that they have carved out within biodiversity hot zones. And that is a really important thing to consider because it essentially means we can't just say, well, we're going to wipe out this whole area and have it just be for humans or, or some other purpose. In fact, where you're sitting right now, assuming you're in Los Angeles County, there are over 200 unique plant species that are within a 50 mile radius of where you are that, that really don't exist in most cases uh, elsewhere. That's an extremely important fact in terms of thinking about preserving where we live right now. In fact, this biodiversity crisis has already had tremendous impact. Uh, we've lost over 90% of our local butterflies, our songbirds and our pollinators in general in Los Angeles County over the last 150 years. And this has been because of habitat loss. Uh, a lot of that, no denying, is the fact that we put 18 million people in that area. Certainly that's a major factor. But also a huge uh, factor is that where we do have green space, and we do have a lot of green space within that area, we have kind of systemically gone in and replaced that with plants from other parts of the world. In fact, uh, we, we've adopted this kind of culture that because we can plant almost anything from almost anywhere and give it a ton of resources, that you know, we can show off the fact that we can grow things from all over the world. Uh, you know, I grew up watching TV of uh, reruns of things like you know bad TV shows like Chips, and you know, so so when I came to live in Los Angeles and I saw the dudes riding around in their motorcycles with the palm trees in the background, that was exactly what I expected. Of course, many of you as CNPS members know there are no uh, palm trees that are native to Los Angeles County, only one palm tree that's native to uh, to the state even, and that's kind of a palm springs kind of tree that we almost never see in landscaping because it's difficult to grow and it's slow and it's expensive and it's bigger. So the palm trees you're seeing in LA or in anywhere in LA County, for those of you down in South Bay areas, those are not part of the ecosystem, but they're so much an icon of our ecosystem. That's just one example of, of how we have brought in plants from everywhere. The official city plant of Los Angeles is the bird of paradise, which is not a native, uh, not a native plant. All of this kind of uh, system, along with grass lawns of non-native grasses and, and just planting trees from elsewhere, all of this combining with habitat loss of paving over everything has contributed to this 90% loss of our insects and, uh, and our other pollinators. And it's important to note that 90% of that of our native insects can only coexist with native plant species. That doesn't mean that they're going to be killed by planting something else that is not native, but what it essentially means is that at some point in their life cycle, if they don't have the important host and food plants that are part of their life cycle, they can't live here anymore. And that's a big part of what's driven some of that loss of, of biodiversity. In fact, birds are a great example. You see our native songbirds, and, and everybody knows you can, in most of our songbirds, they can eat uh, all kinds of nuts and seeds and different things. I mean, heck, most of them will eat French fries if given the opportunity, and will eat all kinds of things. But their babies, in many cases, exclusively eat butterfly caterpillars. If you think about butterfly caterpillars, they're kind of the perfect baby food. They're kind of mushy, and they, you know, they don't they, they, they are easy to digest and uh, butterflies are kind of like the proverbial rabbits where they have many, many, many more offspring that are going to make it to adulthood. And as a result of that, our, our interconnected food web has our native songbirds timing the birth of their fledglings, of their baby birds, for the time when there's an explosion of native butterfly caterpillars. And that explosion of baby butterfly caterpillars only happens if there's an explosion of native plant blooms that those butterflies are all connected to. So it, it, it's it's kind of a chain of, of life that is so interwoven that it's absolutely critical. 
In fact, Lepidoptera, which I actually choked on this time, usually I nail that one, uh, which is a fancy way of saying the moths and the butterflies put together into a larger group. They're responsible for trans transferring more energy from the plant kingdom to the animal kingdom than all other herbivores combined. If you think about that, that's a massively important role that they play. And remember, our butterflies and our moths are directly tied to our plants. They have to coexist with plants that they evolved with. And so that's a really important function of what they do on life, for life on the planet. In fact, our native bees are also extremely important. And many of our native bees have these same kind of important interconnected relationships with our native plants. Most of the time, if you are in uh, the cities of Los Angeles County and you are seeing bees, you're actually seeing the European honeybee, which is an invasive species that has mostly escaped from agriculture where it was used. And it, it is not a particularly efficient pollinator uh, because they are such a successful species in terms of being a generalist. They'll kind of eat anything and go anywhere, but they don't have very dependent relationships with in particular with particular plants. And so they don't have a lot invested in being really efficient pollinators with those plants. On, by contrast, we have uh, over a thousand bee species that are native to the state of California and over 400 in Los Angeles County. And, and in nearly every case, these, these pollinators, these bees that are native to the area are much more efficient pollinators that pollinate at a much, much higher rate. The example here is the native mason bee, which has a 240 times more efficient pollination success rate. Well, that's a that's on the high end, but even, even uh, some of the other ones still are much, many, many times more efficient in terms of pollination uh, than, than, than the, the non-native invasive bees. And so that's just another way where we create this impact of pollinators if we don't have the plants that are connected to them. Let's talk about water. We are entering a period of a water crisis in our state where we're talking about, hey, maybe my, my, my neighbor shouldn't be allowed to have a swimming pool. Maybe I need to turn off the water in between putting the toothpaste on the toothbrush and brushing and rinsing. And, you know, there, maybe I shouldn't flush every time you even hear that from people. Uh, we, we, are, we are aware that we are getting most of the water in LA County from other places, be it the Colorado or from runoff or from our local mountains or from water we're bringing in from the northern part of the state. We're using more water here than nature is providing here. And at the same time, the plants that we are predominantly planting in Los Angeles County use on average six times the water of our drought adapted native species. That's just craziness when we're fighting over all these other issues and, and we're currently in legal battles with Colorado and Arizona and Utah over who's going to get the water of the Colorado River, we continue to plant plants that use much, much more water. And uh, in fact, if you take away one statistic from this, this presentation, I hope you'll take away that 70% of the residential water use in Los Angeles County goes to irrigate primarily non-native landscaping plants. That's a mind boggling factor. Uh, and, and, and of course, agriculture uses up a huge percentage and their commercial uses. So I'm not saying that's 70% of all the water, but the residential use tends to be in the high 20s, so up to 30% by some numbers that I've seen. It is a significant amount of the use that we have in terms of what we use as a society. And 70% of that water, even in the low number percentages I've seen, which are around one fifth, 70% of that is going for landscaping. And our native plants, if you plant the right ones and you do some establishment watering, as many of you know as CNPS people, they can exist just fine on the precipitation diet from nature. In fact, we're actually getting more water right now than we should because of what we're doing to climate. And this is really important because if you think about the glaciers up in the Sierra Nevada, and yes, there are glaciers in the Sierra Nevada. We're not talking about the giant things at the North Pole, but there are permanent ice structures up in the mountains that are close to us in California. Those glaciers are melting faster than they recharge every year. And they have lost 70% of their size since the beginning of the 20th century. And in fact, we're going to be losing all of those glaciers to climate change in most cases within the next 50 years. So what's happening right now is we're not only pulling in water from elsewhere that we're buying and moving, but we're also getting more water from nature in terms of snow melt because of climate change. And that is a temporary function of the melting of these glaciers, which will end at some point. 
This is a really lovely graph that uh, Laguna Niguel's water district put together. And it talks about how uh, we have a lot of plants that we're thinking of as drought tolerant that are not native, that oftentimes use more water than native plants, even though the water needs might be the same. And so the examples here in this graph, and the person put this graph together, I'll give you the examples as I understand what they use to create these numbers here. This gray line that you see on the top, that would be like a low water use lawn. A high water use lawn of high water use grasses would be even higher and more extreme in terms of the amount of water it needs. And so this is the amount of water you need for the plants in a given month, if you look at that this, this chart. The orange line would be a drought tolerant plant, something like bougainvillea, which is a Mediterranean plant you see all over Los Angeles. It doesn't do much for biodiversity, except pro provides pretty good rat habitat. That's kind of the, the main benefit of it, I, I think. Uh, but bougainvillea is a commonly used landscaping plant that is in every uh, traditional big box retailer stores, and you see it planted everywhere in LA. The blue line represents uh, a native plant with similar needs that would be something like lemonade berry, uh, a plant we all know very well of native, as native plant nerds, Rus integrifolia, and, and we all dig it and love it. And they kind of have a similar function. Bougainvillea is kind of a little more vining, but they tend to be about the same size ultimately. So we'll, we'll say they're roughly the same for the purposes of this conversation. Here's the point. Bougainvillea comes from a different part of the world where the rain seasons are very, very different. In fact, very few places on earth have rain seasons that are like what we have in Southern California. And so the bougainvillea needs 15 inches of rain per year. The lemonade berry also needs 15 inches of rain per year to thrive. The difference is the bougainvillea needs it at the time of the year when we don't get it in Los Angeles. The lemonade berry, on the other hand, needs it at the time of the year when we do get it. So if you look at the bougainvillea orange curve, it needs the most water in the middle of the summer. If you look at the lemonade berry, it needs the most water at the beginning of the year and the very end of the year. And if you think about the weather in Los Angeles, our wet season is the end of the year into the beginning of the year during our winter. And so as a result, we have a situation where you can plant bougainvillea and on the, on the chart, it says it has needs the same amount of rain as our native uh, lemonade berry, but you still, to get it to thrive, need to end up giving it supplemental water in the summer because that's when it needs moisture in order to survive. And this kind of relationship is really an important thing to think about when people talk about drought tolerant plants. Often drought tolerant doesn't mean it has the same seasonal water need. And that's a distinction we need as advocates need to be aware of. Energy. I'm going to just speed this up a little bit to talk a little bit more of, about the Westwood Greenway. But uh, as a result of the fact that we bring so much water here from elsewhere, one fifth of the energy that we use in the state of California is going to move water. So that water that we're getting from up in the, the, the northern part of the, the uh, state, it has to go over the green, go over the great grapevine just like you do if you drive up there. So that means all that stuff has to be pumped up over mountains and then brought back down. And of course, then it has to be cleaned and treated. And you know, the water that we're using for landscaping in most cases in our county is potable water that has gone through a tremendous societal expense to move from elsewhere and clean it from elsewhere. We're in a position right now where we're trying to move to renewable energy and we're having some success on that. But one of the challenges is that we often have situations where we have shortages of energy, brownouts of energy, because sometimes renewable energy doesn't provide energy at the times of day when we as a society most crave that energy and use that energy. If we could just reduce our energy use in the state by a couple of a percentage points, one or two percentage points, it would actually do a great deal to smooth our transition to renewable energy. And if, at a time when we're using 20% of our energy to move and treat water, that's a great opportunity to uh, actually reduce our energy use as a society by not using plants that consume so much of that treated and moved water. Water pollution is also a major factor that's connected to natives. Many of you as native plant advocates already are aware that we don't want to put uh, fertilizers on our native plants as a general rule. That's directly connected to the fact that our native plants evolved here in our biodiversity hotspot in the California floristic province, which has lower nitrogen content in its soil than normal. 
So as a result, if you dump a ton of nitrogen in a form of an, um, a soil amendment, then what you are doing is, is, is throwing off that soil chemistry and it's bad for our native plants and in some cases will kill them and certainly in many cases will not allow them to thrive. By contrast, many of the plants we bring in from elsewhere, because we have low nitrogen soil here, they want extra soil amendments. They want extra nitrogen. So as a result, we use a lot of nitrogen in the form of supplements in Southern California. Now that is in, in, in the form of things like you might see like uh, products that you might buy in a little grain form at a, at a, a nursery or a, a big box retailer garden center. It's also in the form of steer manure that you often see on lawns if you walk through different areas of residential parts of LA. And um, it, both of those suffer one common failing, and that is 60% of those amendments will end up in our watershed. Doesn't matter what kind of soil amendments you're using, what kind of nitrogen you're putting on there, just the nature of erosion is that 60% of that, three-fifths of that's going to end up in our water. And this is one of the top three sources of pollution and contamination in our watershed in Southern California. Places like the LA River, River, Bayona Creek, Santa Monica Bay, they all collect this stuff. And a lot of times when you see the beach closed to, to human use, it's because you've had a ton of nitrogen along with other pollution that's gone out there. And sometimes that can cause an algae explosion and it just throws off the chemistry and puts life in peril in, in the water as well as on the land. I throw in the Dodger Stadium thing here because I'm kind of a baseball fan, but also because I think it's a really good point and it's kind of a, a size perspective that most of us can appreciate. We actually create more green waste because we're using so many non-native plants. Now, whether that is lawn trimmings or trees or plants that we're using that are really, really fast growing, that we're putting a bunch of nitrogen and a bunch of water on and giving them all these extra resources, we generate a ton of green waste in, in our county. In fact, we generate enough green waste in the form of trimmings that are removed from our residential areas to fill Dodger Stadium every single year. Santa Monica College did a really interesting study in the yachts where they determined if we would go back to using all the plants that were here 200 years ago, we would actually be able to reduce our green waste by 60% because the plants aren't using all those extra resources and the plants are adapted to the space if you choose the right plants. And in doing so, we can become much closer to sustainability with the amount of green waste that we actually do produce. The important thing of here that is that this actually affects public policy. Many of you may have heard of something called Senate Bill 1383 that passed a few years ago. It's basically the thing that's required us to do green bins. And so the idea is we have all this green waste in the form of both trimmings from lawns and, and plants, but also in form of food waste. And if we take all that stuff, we can turn it into compost. So we're not just throwing it into the landfill. And that's a more sustainable way. Absolutely. Yes, that is true. However, there's a big caveat here. Complying with that law is extremely expensive. LA County estimates that it's costing $840 million annually to comply with that. And that's not even that's even before you consider the cost to our to our air quality, because most of this is being moved by diesel trucks to places way out of town because land is too valuable in L.A. to process all of this stuff here. So all of these trimmings, all of this green waste, the food waste as well, is all being transferred far away to be processed into mulch. And frankly, we're producing much, much more mulch than we can use at this point because that mulch can't be used for growing food because the waste stream has too much contaminant in it. So we are finding that uh, we're stuck with extra mulch and we're still paying all this money to create it. So many of us in school heard the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. The important thing here is that reduce is always the most cost-efficient method of being sustainable. Because if you reduce the amount of green waste you create in the first place, you don't have to worry about transporting it. You don't have to worry about the tremendous cost of creating that mulch and then trying to figure out where we're gonna use all of it. Native plants can actually make an impact in making us more sustainable in this way. Here's our annual rain chart. And this is a really insightful bit of information, at least it was to me the first time I saw it. One of the things that you need to understand is that our rain here is, is different than most places on the planet. And with respect to that, 
It is different because our precipitation cycle varies much more than most places in the world. Let's go back to my discussion of Kansas. We get well over twice the amount of rain in Southeast Kansas that we get here on average. Uh, and the farmers are all heavily dependent on that rain. And in fact, in South, on the Eastern side of Kansas, they don't tend to use aquifer uh, irrigation to supplement the water like they do in Western Kansas. So in Eastern Kansas, it, it really is the entire farming economy is based on a dependency for rain. As a result, uh, when we get that 35 inches or whatever it is of annual rain, if that is like five inches lower that year, there's a crisis and everybody's freaking out. All the farmers, that's all they talk about. I heard this whole time I was growing up. If we get five inches too much, that's also a crisis there because it's too much water and that also is harmful to agriculture. There's a very small window of what they normally expect and normally receive in terms of precipitation. Not true in Los Angeles County. In fact, this is, a, this is from a sample that was taken at USC, downtown LA, but it's applicable all over the county with respect to the fact that if you look at this chart, which goes back to 1877, our average is about 15 inches, but there are almost no years that are within a, an inch of 15 inches. Just a handful of years that are actually near that, that middle point. In fact, you have, you have a lot of years that are down six, seven, and eight, and even lower below five, and you have a lot of years that are above 30 inches. So we have different rainfall here that varies greatly from year to year in Southern California. What's the implication for this? The implication is that our plants that evolved here have two very strong defenses built into their DNA or they would not be surviving here. And they are number one that let's, I'm talking about adult established plants here, of course, but we're number one, when there is a really low water year, they're successful at hunkering down and surviving based on the low water year. So they are drought tolerant. But unlike things that we bring in from a lot of deserts and call them climate adapted because they don't need very much water, our plants are also very flood adapted because they have, a, they have adapted to a climate where we very regularly will get years where we get a whole bunch of extra rain. And our plants are often in many cases good at slurping up that extra rain and as a result are better for flood mitigation than plants that we can bring from elsewhere that don't use a lot of water and don't exist in an ecosystem that has this kind of tremendous crazy up and down like we have in Southern California. Another factor in this is that we have the steepest terrain in the United States. Now that might not make sense to you on first uh, check because it's like, well, the tallest mountains are far, far different places than they are here. But what I mean by this, and if you look at, say, there's your South Coast uh, chapter right there. If you look at Los Angeles and you look at the mountains behind us, what we have in Los Angeles is the greatest uh, amount of steep differential between uh, the area of, our, within the area of our county as a coastal area. So in other words, from the highest point of our mountains to the sea, we only have to travel 40 miles. And that means the rain only has to travel 40 miles. So the rain that comes off of the mountains goes to the water goes to the ocean very quickly here, faster than almost anywhere in the world because it has that elevation which increases the speed of it. So it is all the more important that we in our urban and planning and in our, in our in landscaping planning have sites that are good at retaining water to percolate that water and put it back down into the soil. And a plant a structure is a huge part of this because our native plants are good at sucking up the water when it does come, they are very good at helping us recharge the water into the system. Better than anything else on the world, in the world, we have the, the stuff that nature evolved to do this very task. This is not from Southern California. This is up from Oroville, these two photos. And the reason I keep this in this presentation is because it shows you uh, both uh, Northern California and Southern California, or I showed you, I'm sorry, two, two shots in Northern California, and both in a drought time and in a time when we were getting a lot more water. And so uh, in Oroville Lake, which is one of the dams that we have in that system that brings all that water down here, uh, we had a lot of drought uh, around the beginning of this decade. And that photo at the top is from uh, that period of time around 2021. And then we started getting the wet seasons the last two years, we've had higher rain than normal. Again, that variance is there. And that's happened throughout the state as well. And as a result, 
uh, this 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 dam is actually now filled up completely, but I didn't have a photo that showed the truck there for size and perspective from both of them in, in the same size. But what I want to point out to you here is that the conifer forest, our native forest that's happening around this dam, around this reservoir, those trees are alive in both of those circumstances. They're alive in the extreme drought year, and they're alive in the year when we're getting a ton of extra water, so much so that it's surplus filling up the, the reservoir once again. In fact, for Los Angeles County, we have very good computer models, and I work in this kind of stuff all the time with Climate Reality Project. We have computer models that indicate for the next 200 years with climate change, we're going to get the same amount of rain in Southern California. And that's a, a surprising fact to some people. The difference is, we're going to get that rain in fewer and more extreme rain events. And so that very phenomenon I was talking to you about how our plants are really good at hunkering down when it's dry and doing well when we get too much water, that trait becomes all the more important as we try to survive the changes we've made to the planet with climate change. And there, therein, the only climate-ready plants that make sense in Southern California are the ones that evolved in this kind of up and down cycle. And they're extremely important to what we look at in terms of climate change adaptability. Um, show of hands in the room here. How many of you guys have ever been to the Liberia Tar Pits, which is outside, I think that's outside your official chapter designation, but but it's close enough. We all live in, in the general area and I'm guessing a lot of you are raising your hands. I can't see everybody's face. But uh, a lot of us have been there. It's a really cool place. And you can go there and you can see the Columbian mammoths. You can see the mastodons. You can see two different types of giant sloth, uh, snub-nosed giant bear. All of these megafauna that we have this 100,000 year fossil record of in the middle of urban Los Angeles because of this unique geological phenomenon there with respect to this tar asphalt seepage that comes up through the ground there and was connected to a large oil field that actually drove a lot of the uh, development of Los Angeles a century ago. The interesting thing is we also have plants in that fossil record. And guess what? Of course, there are native plants and we can track that there have been bigger climate changes in the last 100,000 years in Los Angeles at that site than we're actually expecting from climate change. Now we're doing it faster and I'm not a climate denier by any means, don't misunderstand me. We're doing it faster and we're doing it in ways that cause all kinds of other problems. But the point is, our plants that survive today, that are native to our region, had to already adapt to tremendous climate change that wiped out all of this megafauna. So our plants are stronger than Colombian mammoths, stronger than giant sloths. And one, statistic, one, one, uh, one conclusion of this for me is that only human hubris would conclude that we know better than millions of years of evolution and should import plants from other regions to adapt to climate change. And they're in the process of redesigning uh, the Page Museum at the La Brea Tar Pits. And uh, one of the things that one of the organizations I'm involved with is, is and currently active on is trying to get them to use native plants because they don't want to. And it's like, yeah, you know, it, 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 it's, it's an easy call. And, and it's definitely the right call. It doesn't solve all our problems, but it's a better choice. Everybody knows it's getting hotter. I think that's not a newsflash to anybody in the room. You may not realize that it's extreme now. 21 of the 22 hottest years have occurred since 2002. And the last nine have been the hottest of all time. In fact, 2023, NASA has now just determined was the hot, about, well, determined about two months ago, was the hottest year in recorded human history. And in fact, it goes beyond recorded human history to thousands and thousands of more years. We are affecting climate faster and with more dire results than anything that's happened ever. And remember, even though we're going to get the same amount of rain, we're going to have more drought because we will get that rain less often and in more extreme events. So it's really important we capture that rain, but more importantly, we have to be aware that we're gonna have bigger drought periods and more frequent drought periods in between those large rain events. That creates more fire. In fact, if you look at here, uh, this is a fire that happens in Big Sur, one of the biggest that we have had, that's in January. When I was a child, the California fire season was yeah, really kind of thought of as being three months of the year. Today, we have a 12-month cycle with certainly the fires happening in the peak of summer like this one, but also they're happening all year long. 
and the big fires are bigger and they're more extreme and they're more ex destructive. And in fact, six of the seven largest ones in the history of our state have occurred in this decade. Also, as we have notched up temperature, we actually cause more lightning, which most people don't realize. So for every one degree of centigrade, and we've already moved centigrade up at least 1.5 in our count, we increase strikes of lightning by 10 to 12%. So that puts us in the over 15% more lightning than we used to have. So there's the man-made fires, but there's also more fires happening as a result of increased lightning strikes. So the climate again is a system. And when we mess with the system, we have to be aware that lots and lots of metrics are getting moved. Native plants can be our allies in this. Uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes work uh, and, and, and am involved with training for people on wildfire landscaping, wildfire proofing landscaping. And one of the great allies that I always point out is our old buddy, the coast live oak, Corcus agrifolia which uh, you know, many of you guys will know that tree because it's kind of one of the keystone species of our entire ecosystem in Los Angeles and just a lovely tree connected to the, uh, to, connected to the survival of over 500 documented species. But it's also known among firefighters and I have a buddy who's one of those guys who goes out in those big forest fires and fights them with an ax and putting out things and that, that's tremendously physical work. And they refer to the coast live oak as an ember catcher because coast live oak is really good at slowing down fire. When it, it evolved in a situation where it has an expectation of fire, and so it, it can survive fire a lot better than of many other species. And that's true of a number of our native species. Certainly some of them, not so much. My point is when you're doing wildfire planning and preparedness, we do have native species that can be real allies in this, especially if you move remove some of the invasive species that can actually undermine our fire preparedness. But because that fire season is so long now, we have to start, th start thinking about our urban spaces as a genetic lifeboat. It's no longer a luxury for us to be able to say, you know what, Santa Monica Mountains, um, you know, um, Death Valley, uh, up in the, the national parks, the, the state parks, all of that, that's kind of fine for natives. But in our city, we can do whatever we want, right? Not so much, because all of those areas that are outside of our urban environment are much more prone to these big fires because they run out of control now all times of the year. We have to start thinking of our urban forests as a lifeboat for genetic biodiversity. Because the fire season is now much more long and fires are happening much more frequently, much life that is in those systems is having difficulty adapting and recovering because the fires are more frequent and they're more severe. And for genetic biodiversity, we need to think of our, our urban forests as a seed bank to put our native plants to use to be able to preserve biodiversity in an area that is relatively secure from fires. That's a really important thing when we're thinking about how to landscape our cities. There's also a civic pride in cultural identity. You know, I told you guys the story about how I was a nerd and watched shows like Chips or something when I was a kid. Uh, I wasn't even aware when I moved to California that we had so many beautiful plants that are part of our heritage that don't exist anywhere else in the world. These are the things that we should be showing off as icons of Southern California. Stuff like the Coast Live Oak, stuff like our poppy, but not just the, the real mainstream ones, also, you know, thousands of plants that are extremely cool and are part of our heritage and part of what we have inherited as an asset. And that is a big part that ties into the native peoples that are still big parts of our communities and still have much more uh, insight in some of these areas and need to be incorporated into our landscaping choices in our cities. And not just the plants, but all the life that's connected to that is part of our heritage as well. A lot of that's disappearing. This is a tree called the eagle tree that is a native sycamore that was in Compton with, I believe that's within your chapter boundaries. And it was over 350 years old when it finally died in 2022. It had been there long before the city was built out. In fact, it was used as a, a marker on early maps of the era and people would you know, use it as a, a, a way to, to locate where they were. 
This great big tree has been a great big tree for hundreds of years. When it finally died, uh, it was gone for good. All of the other trees that are on that street in Compton are non-native today. In fact, the LA Times wrote an article just recently, I believe it was in late March, where they talked about the 10 most beloved trees that are part of Los Angeles. Only two of them were native. And uh, they kind of had to go out of their way to pick native ones because they were like in Griffith Park or places that weren't in the developed part of the city. My point is here, we're losing a great part of our heritage that's part of what is incorporated into being an Angelino, into being a person who lives in LA County. That's true if you're in RPV, that's true if you're in Torrance, true if you're in Almeida, all those places down there as well. It is essential that we think about restoring some of these landmark trees for future generations. There's also the, the, the very easily uh, determined factor of human health that is connected to biodiversity. If you hear native songbirds, your blood pressure goes down. Medical fact. If you see butterflies, you actually have less stress. Medical fact, documented. If we want butterflies and native songbirds singing in our area to improve the human environment of our urban spaces and of our green areas, native plants are the key to that ecosystem. They're the key to bringing it all together and to making a healthier, more resilient city. This is a street tree fact for city of Los Angeles, but it definitely applies to the other cities that are part of the county. 150 years ago, nearly all the trees that were in the city uh, before we started doing agriculture and planting oranges, and then we did other things. Nearly all of those uh, were native, of course, because we didn't had, hadn't really settled the area. It was still largely just native peoples that had settled the area. It was all basically what had been here for thousands and thousands of years. We started changing that in a hurry. And today, in the 470 square miles that constitute the city of LA, less than 3% of our street trees are native. And every single non-native tree that we put in the city is an island of sterility that is not going to interact with nature nearly as effectively as a native alternate. And in fact, all of our county and city agencies, they're still doing it. That's exactly what they're doing. The, if you look at their documents where they talk, where they brag about how they're now paying attention to biodiversity, there's progress being made, but it is way too little and it's coming way too late. Every single one of the agencies on this page continue to plant either exclusively or a large majority of non-native species in landscaping plants and in trees that they install in our city and in our county. And this is just something that is an, an, a, a, an institutionalized problem that we as advocates have to change. Don't get greenwashed when you're talking about native plants. Don't buy into the idea that there is such a thing as a California friendly plant. Now, there are a lot of good meaning people that are on the same side of this conversation with me that disagree with this, but I stand strong on this because I feel that there can be no plant or tree and plants and trees are plants, but I differentiate only because to the layman, sometimes they don't understand that, but there is no plant that is part of that is friendly to California that didn't evolve here. If you're planting things from elsewhere, then you better bring the soil microbes, the bacteria, the insects, the birds, the bees, the, the mammals, everything with it, or you're just not going to be supporting an ecosystem. And of course, we don't want to bring all of those things because we have all those things here that we already need to support. And yeah, there are metrics out there that say, oh, we only need a certain percentage of native plants and we can then plant other things. Okay, if you're planting stuff for human food or for a recreational field, I'm on board with that. But if you are planting them just for, just for aesthetic reasons, we don't have enough room to do that. If, we, if we're using space for human food and recreational fields, we're not going to get anywhere to 70% in our urban forest native anytime soon if we are just allowing people to just plant a certain percentage of natives. And in fact, one of the things that you often see when there are municipal codes or restrictions that require people to plant a percentage of natives, they don't evaluate that on biomass. They evaluate that on the number of plants planted. And I have seen numerous situations where somebody needs to, uh, uh, to comply with a native percentage metric. And let's say it's 60%. 
and they will plant all the plants they wanted to plant, and then they'll plant a bunch of California poppies so that they can get to the percentage of plants that they want. Two years later, most of those poppies are gone, and they really did not meet the spirit of the original plant. It's important that we put the burden on the people who want to plant non-native plants to justify planting non-native plants. We've got thousands of natives that have been introduced into the landscaping into the landscaping uh, industry here, and they are more than enough for nearly every landscaping need. And if they aren't, then we need to justify planting things that are not going to support biodiversity nearly as effectively. So be skeptical of any person or company claiming there's a solution better than what nature created. In fact, one little side bit that I'll give you there is that you know the number one profit item for big box retailers that have garden centers in their garden center in Southern California, their number one profit item is soil amendments. It's that nitrogen we talked about, not the plants. It's the stuff that they sell for people to put on the plants. And as you know, our native plants don't want that stuff. So it's hard to get those places to sell native plants. That's a big part of the profit motive of why it is difficult to overcome this idea that why don't we just do what nature did for millions of years? Let's talk about the Westwood Greenway. So the Westwood Greenway is this wonderful space in, in the west side of LA that is being used as a native habitat and water cleaning space. And it all is possible because of a spring-fed creek that started in, uh, that, that has been there for as long as humans have been in the region that comes out of the south side of the Santa Monica Mountains. So in this 1894 map, you can see that red arrow at the top. That's about where that spring was. And it still is today. And that water comes out, it's pretty much potable. And then it comes down uh, in, eight, in the 1800s and for thousands of years before that, it comes down a creek that goes right through uh, eventually to Biona Creek and it crosses that little green space at the very bottom of that image. That's where Westwood Greenway is today. So that's the historic path of that creek. It, it was not, it was one of those things that you, you, you might call it a seasonal creek because even though the water kind of kept coming the whole year in the hot parts of the summer, it would dry up before it would make it down there. And then the wet season would have a lot of runoff, but you get the idea. The creek was always a, a part of the functioning ecosystem. And then if you look at the map on the right, you can see a little bit better. You can see where the Westwood Greenway actually is, that star. And you can see that relative to the larger area of the watershed within Los Angeles. And so there's a lot of historic watersheds that are part of our system here. And that's a result, remember, of the fact that we have these mountains and then we have the ocean and all that water that falls in the mountains has got to get to the ocean eventually. And so it created all these different paths. So getting to Westwood Greenway. In 1875, there was this dude who said, hey, if I can build a train, because they're building all these cool, fancy houses, these Victoria Mountains on Bunk Bunker Hill, if I can build a train and get all these people a cool way to get to Santa Monica Beach in the summer, because we don't have air conditioning, and I don't know what air conditioning means because it won't be invented for many years, then they will get on my train, they will come out here, and I can sell them stuff at the beach. So he put together money and created this train line, uh, which, which runs from downtown LA all the way to Santa Monica Beach. And that was an excursion line. And the reason that we have, if you see right in the middle there where there's that, uh, there's that vertical line uh, right above the word Bayona, and then you see the Palms. Palms is actually the first suburb of Los Angeles. And the reason that existed is because the steam trains in 1875 had to stop and get more water at Palms, they couldn't make that entire journey without stopping and getting more water for their, their steam engines that they were using at the time. And that gave birth to the community of Palms, which is just to the southeast of where Westwood Greenway is dated today. Now the city starts developing, the train line changes, it eventually becomes part of the Pacific Red Car Line, which many of you have heard of. And uh, then uh, in later years, it becomes a freight line uh, until it falls into disservice in 1984. But as recently as the 1930s, the, the creek was still intact when we, uh, and that the area just to the, on the north side of the creek and south side of the creek, you see that's not really developed. And the creek is still coming through an ever increasingly developed area of the city. You might also recall that in the 30s, we had tremendous floods in Los Angeles. And that, that led to us creating the, the, the concrete canal that is uh, the Los Angeles River today. And a lot of the different flood control measures that we have. 
which have had real problems for biodiversity and real problems with water retention. Uh, Well-meaning plans that just basically accomplished one metric, which was to keep us safe from floods, but didn't think about the whole system. And so the people who were doing all that same work got it in their, in their heads that what they needed to do was take this creek that's coming from this spring at Brown Canyon and put it into a drain pipe under Overland Avenue where it starts in the, in the south side of the Santa Monica Mountains. And now today it still runs into a drain pipe that goes all the way down south to where Overland Avenue connects up with Bayona Creek. And during that path, it create, it picks up all kinds of runoff from urban runoff. It also create, picks up all that pollution as well. It picks up animal waste, which is one of our top three sources of pollution. It picks up automobile waste, which is another one of those sources. And it creates fertilizers that are going to fertilize non-native plants, which again is one of our top three sources of contaminant in our water supply. So at this point, by 1944, they were planning to develop the area right around where the Greenway is. And they got into a legal battle over the train wanting the station, the area to remain a staging area for the train. They had used it for, they used it to farm sheep at one point, but then they used it to, to store railroad ties and do like a giant dump of gravel and things along those lines. And for a number of reasons that I won't bore you with going into the real details on it, the the Exposition Boulevard, which is a major thoroughfare in Los Angeles, it doesn't go between Westwood Boulevard and Overland Avenue. It just kind of stops, which is right on the north side of this train. And there's also a space on the south side of the train. So the right of way for the train, which is normally like a couple hundred feet, it expands to three, four times that in this particular area. So we have uh, a much larger space for that one particular area, if that makes sense. And you can see that little dotted line there. That's what they're calling the drainage channel, the former drainage channel. That's by Brown Canyon Creek, what's left of it in that particular space. This is by the 1940s. Here we are with the Expo Phase 2. So this is the Expo line, which Phase 1 runs from downtown to Culver City. Phase 2 runs from Culver City to the beach. And uh, the red space there is the Westwood Greenway, which is an expanded space of, of city and county land right around the train station at the Westwood Rancho Park station. So the idea of the Westwood Greenway started as a water cleaning uh, idea. And that's why today it is still managed under both Metro for the train area and the Los Angeles Department of Sanitation. And so the, uh, the original idea for the train line is that they're gonna put a bunch of parking there. And it's a residential stop, which didn't really warrant a giant parking lot. So instead some people in the community got together and they said, hey, why don't we do something to clean the water? Jonathan Weiss is to this day still uh, on the uh, board of directors for the Westwood Greenway Inc. He uh, is an attorney and was actively involved probably more than any other person. But like I said, there was a whole community of people, including Carol Bornstein I mentioned earlier, Annette Mercer, and a whole list of people that got involved and said, hey, instead of putting a parking lot here that will have to be patrolled and nobody really uh, needs it based on the, the train's ridership numbers. Why don't we use this area to resurface Brown Canyon Creek, which has been for the better part of a century in a drainage uh, line that goes underneath or, uh, Overland Avenue. Let's resurface it and clean that water there before it goes into Bayona Creek a couple blocks south of here. And so that's what the plan was about. So as you can see in this graph, though, the, the water is underneath Overland Avenue it goes into a holding tank and then it goes through a filter and then it gets pumped up to the uh, Westwood Greenway where it then gets released into a creek that goes about a yeah, third of a mile down, third of a mile down the creek, down the train in one side. And then it goes into a, another drain. It goes underneath the train and it gets pumped back up again with another pump. And then it goes back to where it started a third of a mile back the other way. And then the uh, water goes through another filter and then it goes back into that same drain pipe and then it goes into Bayona Creek a couple of blocks south of here. And so that water, when it comes in, it's heavily polluted from all this runoff from over 2,400 acres of urban sources. And that also includes people overwatering their lawns. So there's actually more water there than there would be just with the ground, Brown Canyon Creek water. But there's also all that pollutant that we talked about as well. And so the idea here was to let the natural processes clean this water. 
And a, a couple of years after this uh, project kind of began as an idea, I got involved and I, I, I was the one saying, hey, let's use native plants as part of that because we can create biodiversity and habitat. And native plants can do the cleaning. So now what happens is the water comes up, the water is cleaned by sunlight, which disinfects a lot of the water. The water is cleaned by native plants, which absorbs a lot of those pollutants and processes a lot of those pollutants and puts them into the ground. And the water is cleaned by a gravel pit at the very end of the process before it goes back into the system. That water, when it comes out, is heavily polluted. At the end of the process, it's almost potable water again. It's amazing how much that those natural processes can clean that water. UCLA has done two studies on it, and the numbers even shocked me in terms of how much it cleans the water. But in fact, from being involved in this project all the time, I can tell you that uh, I, I, I clean the areas and deal with the plants at the areas at the very beginning of the process, and that dirt is disgusting, and there's a lot of pollution in it. And we take out some of the cattails that grow in there and, and pro take them to hazardous waste kind of a thing. But the dirt at the very end of the process, you can walk in that all day long. It is so much cleaner. It's amazing how just in the confines of this space, the space gets much, much cleaner. The water gets much, much cleaner. Here's what the space looked like in 2009. This is compacted soil. Unless it just rained or you pour a bunch of water on it, you could not get a shovel into this water without some kind of hydraulic assistance. I know because I tried. And the, the soil is highly compacted with very, very reduced uh, bioactivity as a result of that. The plants that you do see uh, are pretty much exclusively native, no, I'm sorry, non-native invasive species that have come in from the residential areas that are adjacent to this space. And then those trees over the course of the of since 1984, when this space wasn't being used, had grown somewhat in this area. Here's an overhead in 2009, a few months later, when they actually removed the rails that were from that old trail line, train line, because they had to put in new straighter rails for, for as they were moving forward with the plan to put in the train line. So that whole strip of dirt is basically the Westwood Greenway today. I was heavily involved with a number of people to try to get them to use native plants on the entire phase two of Expo line. And the original plan for Expo, and they are spending billions of dollars on a train line, but that also means they're spending millions of dollars on irrigation or, or on, on landscaping to go with those train lines when they build them. In fact, Metro builds some of the biggest landscaping projects in the entire region when they build a train line. And the original plan called for exactly zero natives to be in the entire train line. We fought with them for three years and, and they were completely unreceptive to this. We would get arguments like, well, Charles, if we put in your low water native plants, then uh, we are going, they're all gonna get killed by all the irrigation lines we're putting in for all the other plants. And so that's kind of one of those kind of eh, kind of logic moments. It's like, well, then why are you putting in plants that need so much extra water? Why are we doing things this way? It's a matter of unlearning processes, contracts with people that install irrigation lines that we don't want and don't need, uh, tons of plastic pollution that comes with all of that, and contracts with nurseries that are growing high water use plants that they have used in every project for the last 50 years. And we, those are the kind of barriers that we're still to this day fighting. And we've made some progress in those areas. So Expo, after three years, they came back in a big public meeting with us and said, you know, Charles and, and, and your compadres, we, we heard you. So we're gonna add two native plants to the system, uh, two that we think will work with all the plants that we wanna put there, cause that's what we wanna do. So then we mobilized at a higher level. And we got, we put together a coalition that I still to this day called LA Native that we work for different projects that are similar to this. And we had over 30 stakeholder groups. We had HOAs, we had neighborhood councils, we had uh, different uh, environmental groups. We had transportation groups that had never thought about landscaping before as part of what they were doing. We had politicians who were involved, all kinds of people coming together to say, this is what makes sense and this is what we want. We're the ones who live here and this is what we want you to do. It took a lot more time and a lot more showing up at people's doors or showing up at, at politicians' doors, showing up at hearings, doing things that, that result in, you, you, you know you're making progress when you show up at the politician's office and they kind of look down and they sigh. I'm not saying you ever need to be rude to anybody, never need to be unkind to anybody, don't do that. 
but you need to let them know you're not going away and you're not going to give up on what you say is right. By 2013, we had largely accomplished a, a native landscaping palette and we did our uh, groundbreaking, which included the Greenway as well. A lot of these people were heavily involved in all of that. Some of them you might know, some of them have, have been involved in your meetings before, a good bunch of people. You know, 2013 was a key moment because the train didn't open until 2016. But in 2013, we had to put a pipe under the train to move the water from one side of the train to the other side of the train. That pipe's like $50,000 if you do it before the train's there. But if we didn't get that work done until after the train's there, that pipe's like $5 million, $3 million. It's something like ridiculous, exponentially more expensive. So that's why it's so important as an advocate to, to not just wait till, you know what, I'll get involved when they do the landscaping. You have to be involved at the very beginning of planning because all of these things are connected and it's an ecosystem in and of itself. So five million, five and a half million dollars of money was found that was left over from other projects. That was the core of the money here. I should point out that it's a very small percentage of this that actually was required for landscaping, uh, but it's a lot of money that was needed to pull off this big industrial kind of strength, uh, not industrial, but this big, uh, you know, moving earth kind of project around a train station where we're doing all this water cleaning. So there's 2013 when we're about to put in the pipe that goes under where the train is going to be. The rail's still not there. There's 2015. The rail is in. That pipe is in. There's nothing that looks like a greenway. In fact, the Westwood Greenway, for the last time, hopefully in its history, is serving as a staging area for a train line. Just like it had for the, all the way back to 1875, this expanded space was used to park uh, things that would be used in building a train. By 2017, Expo Line is open and running, and it quickly becomes the most highly used light rail line in an urban space in the entire country, which is a pretty startling statistic. By 2019, and I, for, I, I apologize for the different, uh, for the different uh, tone and the darkness and the light of these different photos. They're all from Google satellite pictures, and some days it was more cloudy than others, and you get what you get kind of a thing. By 2019, the earthwork begins in terms of creating the uh, the actual habitat restoration and getting the water up and running so that we have something going there. By 2021, the original plants are in, the water is up and running, and it's doing what it's supposed to do. By 2022, all of these photos were taken there. So today, Westwood Greenway is the showpiece of the corridor of native landscaping along the Metro E line, formerly the Expo line, which is now the longest street strip of restored urban land, native lands habitat in the country, is my understanding. And uh, it's a contiguous uh, strip. And all of these shots of life were taken at the Greenway. None of this stuff was there before. I mean, if you just walked it, it was like a desert and it was super, super quiet and not even a desert in a good way. I shouldn't use that as an analogy because deserts are ecosystems themselves, but it was like you know an empty cold space. And then within two years of putting in all the plants, they had filled out with life of all kinds. You stick that shovel in the ground now, you get live soil that's full of interesting stuff, full of cool things and is productive. So this is where I wind up and tell you, hey, you can be a part of stuff like this too. And we can reverse the inertia of 150 years of disastrous ecosystem replacement through grass hold, grassroots stakeholder pressure. You just have to get involved and let them know you're not going away. And I really, and Brett and I were talking about this at the beginning, for those of you who came here early, I, I one of the reasons this really appeals to me as an area of advocacy is that you know, I come from a really conservative part of the country and I can have a conversation with people who are really to the right of me about this and they still get it. And I can have a conversation with people who are at the very bleeding edge of the left as well and they get it. This is not one of our issues in our highly divided society that has to be that highly divisive, uh, of highly divisive nature. In fact, we can talk about this and we can have productive conversations with all kinds of people because People get it when it comes to talking about nature and the importance of nature if you, you frame it for them in a way that's accessible and work with them together on the projects. You can be part of the solution. You're already part of the solution by being here and part of CNPS. You can also get involved in what's going on locally in your area. Figure out 
what can be done, how we can create other Westwood greenways throughout the area, you know, figure out a space that makes sense for that. Then call somebody like Brent or call somebody like me and say, hey, do you know anybody who can help us figure out a way to try and make something like in this spot? You know, recruit people, take a position, keep showing up at politicians offices, let them know you vote and you care about this stuff and make sure that they understand there's a connection between landscaping and all these other environmental issues that they might already be engaged on. One of the best things you can do as an advocate is help somebody who's in a position of power to do something they already want to do. And if you can tie in biodiversity into helping them with their own agenda, that's a great way to do it. Yesterday, we had a really fun time for those of you who came out and some of you are in the room and I thank you for coming. Uh, we had a really good time. We talked about plants. I'm nerding out here in front of a coastal live oak tree. We talked about plants, a lot of the history we talked about here. We talked about plants in particular that you can use in your spaces, you know, native plants as container plants if you live in an apartment like most people do in our, in our urban area. Lots of different choices. I also promised everybody, I gave away a bunch of plants that a buddy of mine had given me uh, from a nursery. And uh, I also promised everybody that I would put a website on here in this presentation that would give you a guide in terms of taking care of all those plants that we gave out. If you're gonna keep them in a container for a while or you're gonna use them, we're kind of at the end, the very, very end, arguably past it of when the planting season should be. So maybe you wanna keep plants in a container short-term or long-term, or maybe you wanna put them in the ground right now and have extra special needs because we're getting into the hot time. I cover all of these issues and more in a thing I put together that's at this website at the Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance site. And so take a picture of that shot if you want to have that website, screen shoot it, whatever you need to do. That's there. Uh, the Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance keeps that up indefinitely because we do plant giveaways occasionally. And um, so there are other sources out there. Certainly Carolyn Bart's book is a wonderful source, certainly much more detailed than my, my little web page here that gives you some basic in information. Lots of other sources out there that Brent probably has talked about with you guys before in the past. But there's one that can be good for giveaways. And guess what? We're gonna do something like this again. So it's not gonna be a CNPS devoted day, but we are going to do another tour and that's gonna be followed by a weeding day that you can come and just come for the tour. I'll just be happier there. If you wanna stay for the weeding and removing invasive plants, that's super cool too. But uh, it's gonna be at 10 a.m. on June 30th, which is a Sunday. And uh, we'll be doing that with the Los Angeles Neighbor Council Sustainability Alliance and Surfrider LA. So it's kind of a nice mix because all the Surfrider people are like young hip dude kind of people. And then the, the LA the sustainability people tend to be a lot of gray hairs and eh, not all, but some. And so it's a cool, cool mix of people. And then uh, CMPS has members of all kinds of ranges. You guys can come network with these people who are all there for the right reasons. And, uh, you know, you can, right now, we do not have this posted on the Westwood Greenway site. It will be posted in the next few weeks. So just trust me, I'm the one giving the tour. It's definitely going to be real. And so you can take a shot of this or check back at the Westwood Greenway at some point. Uh, it's possible that uh, Brent will have this posted on the South Coast Chapter page at some point as well. There's also a Facebook page for Westwood Greenway. If you can't make this, or even if you can, and you want to get involved in Westwood Greenway in some other way, twice a month, we have weeding days. And twice a month, we have watering days for the establishment plants. We have a list of about 100 plants that are being established that we do supplemental watering on every single uh, month, do a couple times a month kind of a thing. And you can be on one of those teams. Each one of those teams goes for one two-hour slot uh, once a month kind of a thing for the watering. That's it. So thank you guys so much for listening. I did the long version because you guys were my people. And so if I bored you to tears, I apologize but I wanted to share all the stuff I'm enthusiastic with you guys about this. And so that's that's where we are. And if there is time, and I know I'm, I'm running along here, but if there is time and somebody wants to ask questions, I'm certainly available for them. Well, thank you so much, Charles. There is, there's one question in chat that popped up just now. I think people were holding their fire. So people, if you want me to read your question, you can put it in chat. You can also speak up yourself. But D is asking, uh, what type of invasive plants are the biggest issues for the Westwood Greenway this season? You know, the, the, the most aggressive invasive plants are actually riparian plants. Because if you think about it, riparian plants are the ones that get kind of unlimited moisture resources. So if a plant grows right at the bank or in the water, 
uh, it generally, as a rule, grows much, much faster than plants that uh, that don't. And so, yeah, we have the usual suspects of the invasive plants, but we have things like uh, blue speedwell, which is also called Veronica. We have uh, spotted lady's thumb, which is um, Persicara maculosa, I believe, is the name of that. We we have like a handful of about five invasive species that just will, if left un, undealt with, they will completely fill up that creek absolutely uh, within one summer, within one within one half a year period. And so uh, the sanitation and uh, the uh, the metro, they do provide a limited amount of maintenance for the area. We usually ask them to concentrate on those plants because they're so aggressive and the, the problem is nonstop. And it's also kind of gross to get into the water, especially in the area that's more polluted. And so they mostly deal with that. But when it comes to dealing with the invasive grasses, with the, uh, you know, the the oxalis species that are invasive with the, um, uh, the, the, the more drought tolerant plants that you traditionally see like fennel and mustard and, you know, uh, uh, the, the usual suspects that you, that you have for, for dry area stuff. We try to take that, uh, try to take care of that with our volunteer group because there's still a lot, a lot of work there to be done. Uh, we have English Ivy coming over the fence from neighboring, uh, you know, buildings. Those things never end but at least they don't happen quite as quickly as the invasive riparians, which boy, they'll just knock you out in a hurry if you're, if you're not careful. Are there any other questions from the group? Oh, here's one uh, from Adele in, uh, uh, in chat. She says, how would you suggest going about changing the street trees on your block? I am in North Redondo and the street tree is palm trees. Well, you know, um, I don't advocate for the removal of mature trees because I'm a big climate guy. A uh, mature tree canopy is extremely important to the heat island effect within a city and to mitigating a lot of the heat within a city. And if we've already invested the money to make a tree and to have a mature tree, then we should play out the life cycle of that tree. But what I am an advocate for is whenever we have a new development with new space or we have an area where an, a tree has gotten old and life spanned out, that's when we should always plant natives. And we have an opportunity to do that. And you asked about palm trees, Adela, and that's a particularly interesting phenomenon because the majority of palm trees that were planted in LA County were planted in the 19, in the pre-war period, the pre-World War II period. So 1920s up until 1940s is when the vast majority of the palm trees that you see in LA were actually in the larger LA County were planted. That's an interesting statistic because the average lifespan of things like, uh, uh, Washingtonia robusta, uh, which is the Mexican fan palm, uh, a lot. The average lifespan is about a hundred years, sometimes 120 years. So within our generation, most of the palm trees that you see in LA County today are going to have to be replaced, and those don't provide any shade really whatsoever. So they're even bad from a shade standpoint in terms of canopy. And then there's the issue of you know palm fronds falling on people as a safety hazard. In fact, a lot of this, a lot of areas of the city are not even allowed to plant plant them a lot of areas of the county. And I don't know specifically of the code in, in Redondo Beach, but it wouldn't surprise me if the politicians there are very receptive to the idea that we shouldn't plant more palm trees because they're a safety hazard, they don't provide any shade. And on top of that, they're really expensive. They're usually at least twice as expensive as any other type of tree that you might plant, including all of our natives. So that's a great opportunity to say, every time one of these palm trees gets old, Let's put in a, nat a native species since we're not going to put a palm tree there to replace it because that doesn't make sense. Yeah, and Adela, I would suggest that uh, you may find a reception uh, in your favor at the city council. Your interim mayor is a uh, also the head of the uh, South Bay Parklands Conservancy. So he is some green cred right there. Um, Let's see. Oh, she she had a little follow up question. What native is a good street tree? Is her follow up question, um, which is actually I think that's a whole new topic. Honestly, you you've done some research into that. It is a whole new topic. I I and as as being involved with the Community Forest Advisory Committee of Los Angeles, uh, a committee of us which includes the uh, several environmental activists, all native plant people, the guy who's the head of the nursery of tree people, lots and lots of people came together on this. And then we vetted it with other experts as well before we published this list. But well, we didn't really publish it. We presented it to the city. Um, they have yet to adopt it. But we put together a list of 87 trees that are appropriate as street trees. 
And we really emphasized things that don't fit in every situation. So because we don't want people who are doing city urban forestry work to think of one size fits all type trees. Uh, one of the things they would commonly complain about us is that there are no trees that we can put in a small parkway where it's like three foot or four foot or even two foot. That's actually a real strength of our ecosystem. It's just, they call them shrubs. And so if you take something like uh, mountain mahogany or you take something like um, uh, red shanks or something that we don't even think of as trees, they can easily be pruned effectively into a small tree to fit in a really tiny space. We have lots of good opportunities in every type of size. And so as a result, anytime somebody tells you we don't have good native street, street trees for any application, it's hogwash. I guarantee you it's based on a misunderstanding of things and a lack of understanding of our native species, especially. So we have lots and lots of good native trees for every type of planting situation. Um, but I hesitate to tell you what is a good street tree because there is no tree that I would tell you is a good fit for every situation. Um, and, and you really need to determine what the needs are of a particular site. And then we have lots of options to do that. And I have that list that I talked about with 87 trees. I can share that with Brent at some point if you guys want. And if you, uh, if he's willing to, he could share it with you. Or you can email me directly, and I'd be happy to share it to you, with you. And we break that down in terms of the space available, in terms of whether or not it is a coastal area or not coastal, whether or not it is a, uh, a particularly hot area, other factors that are going on, whether or not it needs to be pruned to keep it tight, uh, it's going to have, you know, walkway area issues. All of those factors are things that we considered. And I guarantee you, there's still multiple options for every one of every situation you can come up with. Yeah, I think we corresponded about that. And I may I have so. already. So if, if you don't mind, I'll I'll post it on our website. Please do. Yeah, we have, uh, I mean, it, it's always being tweaked. So there might be a few minor changes in the version we have now. But what you have is going to be, I'm sure, 98% the same as what we're we're looking at right now. So. Right. And uh, Julian is asking, has the city or Metro's maintenance budget been adequate for the Greenway uh, as anticipated? No, <laughs> in one word. Uh, but, you know, that's one, one of the problems with some of these large funds that come from Prop O and uh, Prop 84 are that you cannot use money that's meant for capital improvements to be for maintenance of those capital improvements which is kind of nuts. And I think it's something that the state is eventually going to change in terms of the way the law is structured. But as a result, um, the, quite frankly, they, they, they thought that they could just put a huge irrigation system in Westwood Greenway, which they did, which was a battle we lost. That broke within the first six months and it's never really made any sense to be there anyway. So we have a bunch of plastic waste and virgin resin plastic in the form of irrigation drip lines throughout the, the Greenway that are buried everywhere and they can't fix them because they'd have to destroy all the plants that are there to do it. And we wouldn't want them to fix them even when we did. The whole point was to plant stuff that can live off of the water that we get from nature. And on top of that, we have a creek there if we ever need any extra source of water. So um, so the point is uh, they weren't prepared for that. And, and there are some good, well-intentioned people, but there have been missteps. They hired uh, both Metro and the city of sanitation hired a company that's primary uh, business model was installing, installing artificial turf to be in charge of maintenance at the Greenway. Not a single person had any training on California natives. And so rather than just get mad and walked away, we spent two years training their people, working with them, helping them understand, uh, you know, how to do things. There were missteps along the way. They, you know, the first month they were there, they cut down one of our three Southern California black walnuts because they thought it was a tree of heaven. And, um, you know, you just have to chalk it up to experience. We're learning as we go. Right now, sanitation is providing enough money to pay for two, two guys, two workers to be on site one day a week. And the Metro budget is even smaller than that. And so because that is insufficient to do what we need done, we've asked them to just focus on those riparian invasive species in the creek and our volunteers are doing everything else. And so that's why the community is such an important part of this process because we we have to uh, we have to do that or the whole thing uh, you know is not going to last. And eventually we hope to turn this into a thing where we have docents there all the time and we have more people touring it and we have more maintenance funds and things to support that. But it's an ongoing project. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jader is asking: Are they hiring any botanists? 
Not currently. We, we do have several people at UCLA that are doing studies uh, that are connected to graduate student work at UCLA because uh, we're about eh, two miles south directly of UCLA on Westwood Boulevard. Um, and, and so they're heavily involved in the science that's being done there. Uh, but no, there's no funding currently to hire a botanist. I am a volunteer. I am not a botanist, but I am a native plant uh, certified landscaper and also just a real nerd who loves to talk plants. So most of the plant management of the native plants in terms of new things we've introduced, how we tried to make adjustments going forward, it's kind of fallen onto my shoulders and then my larger group of people on the board that we share these decisions together and make those choices. And we've done creative things to find funding from like neighborhood councils to do things and to introduce more species uh, than were there before. And we're trying to fill it out with all kinds of stuff that you might've seen there 200 years ago. Yeah, uh, looks like that's the end of the questions. I'll, I'll give you a comment. And I think the comment ties back to something that you said early in your talk. You said that you should choose, maybe that was our, our pre-discussion. Uh, if you are interested in, in moving the needle on environmental issues, choose something local, be prepared to focus on it for years and years and years. And what I noted about your timeline was that it looks like from 2009 to 2013, you worked on policy changes. Uh, yeah. Then there was a waiting period. And then 2019 was the beginning of the gardening portion where that's that's the fun part, right? So you waited from for 10 years, a decade to begin to garden. Uh, and then the gardening took three years. The end of the garden was 2021-ish. So you've got a period of time of uh, 12 years there from 2009 to 2021 to, to just, just to book in the project with some milestones of planning and gardening. And I'm sure there was some, uh, some pre-running going on. So um, my story back to you is um, that, that your lesson about finding something local and finding something you can dedicate yourself to um, certainly rings true for your project. And um, the scope of that is revealed in, in the timeline that you were kind of casual about, but it was a dozen years at least. Yeah, it was a long, and, and you know, I, quite frankly, I'm okay with that. I love the plants. I love going out in nature. I love hiking. I love enjoying the plants, learning about the plants. But if, if I have a strength, it is that I am, I'm comfortable moving in those political circles and comfortable doing that advocacy. And so I've made that a big part of, of my environmentalism. But uh, it, I have friends who do a lot of guerrilla planting of natives. And that's cool. And that 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 makes an impact. There's no question about that. But it doesn't change the system that created all of these problems in the beginning. And there are very good, well-intentioned people within the system of what we call our society who just still to this day don't understand the importance of this or understand how this change is a natural, easy change to make. And you can find those people and make them your allies. And that was part of what had to happen here. Uh, there were still people resisting this right up to the end and even people trying to change it once it had already been agreed to. Uh, but we had to just keep building our uh, our stakeholder group, building our coalition. When you walk into the politician's room and sit down and have a competition with or co conversation with that person, um, it's important that they know that it's not just some dude named Charles who lives there and he represents one vote and may or may not even be in your district. It's important that they know that you represent, along with the people in the room with you, a coalition of many people who share this point of view, people who are voters, people who are actively engaged, people who care about civic engagement or they wouldn't be there. So civic engagement is a huge part of being an environmentalist. And it's something that sometimes we, who those of us who love nature and like to get away from all that, aren't comfortable with all that. That's something we gotta get comfortable with because we have a limited time to, to make this planet sustainable and livable and it takes every one of us involved in that in that in that fight. And so, like your to your point, Brent, a lot of times the the bulk of the work is done changing hearts and minds. It's not in in putting in, uh, you know, Commerostaphylus diversifolia and saying, oh, this is such a cool rare plant, and 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 watching it grow. That's the fun stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. I think I speak for everyone to say that you have a. Great presentation and a great project there. Uh, it's been our pleasure to have you talk to us this evening.
it was real. It was my pleasure as well. Thank you, everyone, for this opportunity.